People have been sold the lie of salvation, and in order to earn their promissory note to enter heaven, they have to follow a man-made religion and the Bible. What are your thoughts about the psychology and brainwashing behind the Christian movement? Yeah, wow, what a question. Oh, by the way, I just want to remark, brilliant questions that you've been sent. Uh, just very inspiring. Well, it's all brainwashing because consciousness has been brainwashed by this higher level priesthoods, you know, for years. And I don't care whether it was Akhenaten or something before. Um, it's been the order of the day since the dawn of time. So what we're dealing with is a very clever priesthood, the solar one. And as we're now noticing, priesthoods, plural, very clever with definitive knowledge about us. Why wouldn't they brainwash us? Don't adults brainwash their children every single day? You'll believe what we tell you. We know best. Right? So hierarchies was one uh, after the great ancestral trauma hierarchy, which is not evil in itself, by way, by the way, it gets things done. So does slavery. But hierarchy was brought in as a galvanizing system in all the cultures because of this wreck and ruin that had occurred before. Then they find out this hierarchy works really good. As long as you obey the masters, you get your bowl of soup, right? You're protected and all this, and you feel part of the crowd. You were traumatized, so you, you feel, it's good to feel galvanized with your culture. So everything we call a Celt, a Gaul, you know, a Roman, whatever, a Visigoth, I don't know what, all the different, all the different cultures, you know, came out of, of the hierarchies. By being galvanized, they re-got their identities. Before the identity of anyone called an Ionian or a Dorian or a Pelasgian or a, a Mycenaean or a Minoan, right? That's all latter day. That's all, you know, new gear coming out of the wash that you put on with your name on the back of it. Hey, great number 11. Yeah, he's, he's great. Before that, there was all different attributions and nomenclature. But hierarchy is the answer to this because it's pathological. I said there was some good things about it, but even then the good thing about it was it responded well to a trauma. doesn't mean it's good in itself. And ultimately, if it's taken too far as it was in all of these later periods after the, you know, the bronze age, it became pathological and it's stuck to this day. It, it comes, it devises, it, it's devised by pathological thinking and it perpetuates pathological thinking ultimately. Uh, scholars have shown that subjectivity, the idea that I even have an I or subjective being within me to introspect is completely historically recent. Well, right. Then you're just like a chess piece in a box. You're like a little, uh, you know, a little plastic army that can be arranged on the hierarchy. And you're not going to say, you don't even have an I to say anything about it. Any comment you would have ever made back then is the same as the next guy's comment. Hail Caesar. That's about as far as it went. And if hail Caesar, if Caesar says, stand on your head, you stand on your head. If he goes, there, those people are my enemy, go and butcher them and leave not even a child alive. All right, that's what happens. Uh, the Phoenicians, I don't like them anymore. Can you wipe them all out? Well, when you say all, uh, Caesar, what do you mean by all? No, I mean, all. You mean the children too and the animals? Yeah, all. And then with poor salt, this has actually happened, pour salt on Carthage so that nothing can grow after they're all been wiped out. That's called erasure. And in its place is a hierarchy. So they must be connected in some way. You didn't even have the I-ness to stand up and say, I don't think so. There's no Captain Kirk going question for God. Why does God need a spaceship? There's no such thing. It's just conformity. And even the slightest sign of individual thought, you were dead. You were put in the galleys. You were put in the chain to a wall in the dungeon. So. And then as, as these great scholars also show you that when subjectivity did come online and the thought of independence, well, we didn't want it. So whether it was suppressed or it wasn't suppressed, man just said, well, I don't want, I don't even want that. That's why we're here now. We are here now because when we were first given the mere, mere you know, modicum of individual thought, we did, we rejected it. What, what do they say? I've ever seen a football match? Ever seen an arena? It was no different back when they were at the time of you know Caesar Augustus, the arena, as it is today. There's no difference in that. The, the collectivity will never end. But, but subjectivity and individualism, 
it's it's dying by the day. So that hierarchy and that structure and that depersonalization, which is a kind of brainwashing, right, is ubiquitous. It's been there with us all through time. And it's dissidents, it's dissenters, or you can count on one hand. So it's tragic. Back, you know, when they're all the way, putting people in the wicker man, I don't know. And anyway, check out the symbolism. Here's a bit of astrotheology again. Check out the actual symbolism, like say the heraldry of modern nations or royal houses. Right? The great mythologies of the Celts, like I said, the hunt or the chase. Where the hell is all of that coming from? It's all cosmic. And so because of the hero and because of the mystery and because of the awesomeness of the zodiac and the stars, we wanted somebody to translate that to us. And that became the priest. And then the priest decides, well, look, I'm very interested in the esoteric side, but I think we're going to have to elect somebody to keep people down in a more of an autocratic way. We need that figure. All right, we'll, we'll have a thing called a king. And then we need other priests because there's this emotional side of us. Remember I said they had the definitive knowledge of us? They go, we need another group lower than us who specialize in taking care of, you know, the uh, emotional nonsense of these, these, these farm animals. And so we get the priesthood on the lower level that we know. So theocratic control, autocratic control, crown and gown. Then they see to their amazement, it bloody well works. It, it just works. So keep on wheeling out the same, you know, horrendous uh, juggernaut down through the ages. And behind it, you know, just real independence is what we're doing right now. Independence is to say, what lay be all behind this? And then finding out about astrotheology, sidereal mythology, and then realizing, like I did back in the 80s, every single one of the myths of my country, all the Celtic myths, can be seen as euphemisms of cosmic events, including the coming of great comets. All the mythologies. And the same can be done with Britain, like King Arthur, that sword, that lance, that chariot, that, that dynamic between the twins, that thing about the unfaithful woman. We're, it's all coming from the stars. Could you believe it? Absolutely amazing. But, but the thing is that uh, they know, they knew the nature of consciousness, even back then. And one thing that is behind the question of, you know, that is Christian or it's religious is this. They knew that um, early man, this would be pre-Vedic, you know, going back many thousands of years BC, was actually not interested in supernaturalism. This is another thing I try to bring to bear. They were very grounded, very earthy people, very practical. They did worship, but they worshiped in a different way. And so because of the cataclysm and the travesty and the trauma that it brought up, a certain bunch of uh, incidents happened that gave rise to the priestarchy. There's, there's actually concrete reasons. You know, and again, you know, this is not to be confused with my Atlantis book at this point, because I give a very strong you know, argument there for their arising. But there's another school that gives another account of why a priestarchy arose. And it had to do with the trauma, but it was also part of their definitive knowledge of us was to understand that there's fear. There's legitimate fear because nature is to be feared. So the, the practical workaday man of the ancient world who awed the universe was also in somewhat fear of it because sometimes it acts, you know, there was, it, it, the real thing here, actually, when you dissect it, we don't want to do that here, is the fear of animals. It's a whole dynamic about the combat myth, what's called the combat myth, and why you see uh, all throughout the tradition. Well, we were talking about, you know, we were talking about ubiquitous symbolism, proving dispersion. One of them is the combat myth where you see like Thor fighting the great Midgard serpent, uh, Marduk fighting the bull and the lion, uh, Samson in the lion's den. You had the previous uh, Daniel in the lion's den. All of these are re-commenting on the great combat myth, right? You get it all over the world. So there is a certain fear element. It's not a bad thing. It's completely rational. Animals attack you at night and so on. 
So the priesthood is aware of this. Part of their definitive knowledge of us is the fear that undergirds consciousness. When the cataclysm came about, this fear element ramped up. So the authors who only talk about animal fear are mouths off. They're brilliant people, but they miss this piece. The fear is already there. It's meant to be there. It's part of our ancestral you know, makeup. But when the great cataclysm come, it was like you know, fear squared. Fear now became a very dominant part of our consciousness. And that is what left us open then to manipulation of the kind that you're talking about.